What we have here today is the 1920 Argon Model D two passenger roadster. Now, Bobby, you said the Argon, and you're correct. When we say the Argon, this is it. They only made 24 cars, and this is the only one remaining. Of the 24 that they made, only two of them had the Rochester Duesenberg engine, and we happened to have the high-performance model That's right. as the sole survivor. They started off with an engine manufactured by Buda, a major engine manufacturer of the day. And what was different about the two engines? Does this have more horsepower? They're radically different. The Buda was a 50 horsepower engine. The Duesenberg engine is a 100 horsepower engine, twice as much power. They had to modify the frame in order to accept the additional power of the bigger engine. So I think that's interesting because manufacturers today do that. You know, Mercedes has the AMG line, Cadillac has the CTS, the V line. So this is a high performance engine based on the same chassis. Exactly. And power wars have been going on for a long time. And they were still going on in the 1920s. Absolutely. The Argonne name comes from the Battle of the Argonne Forest in France in World War I. It was the heaviest, most savage battle that the American troops fought in in World War I, and it was very fresh in the American memory. So it was a very recognizable symbol. The car has survived, just as we did in the Battle of Argonne. We won through in the end. These are called Macbeth eyeshade headlight lenses. That eyeshade part, that sort of eyelid, is uh -huh. there to keep the beam from shining up into oncoming driver's eyes. And then we also have this emblem here, which is on top of the radiator. It's a radiator cap. This is a radiator cap, but it does more than just hold the, the water in. If you turn this around, we can see what the driver's looking at. Well, and that is a simple bulb well, thermometer. That. that is your engine temperature gauge. Now I'm wondering, we're both golfers. Yes. Where do you put your clubs? Well, funny you should ask. What you're looking at here is actually called a golf club hatch. And I happen to have here a little key for us. Shove them in and off you go. That makes sense. And I don't see a actual trunk in the boot here. There is no trunk lid. So if one of your golf balls gets loose back there, you have to send a kid for it. Right. We're at the back of the car now, Steven, and I see two spare tires. What's up with that? Well, yes, Bobby, tires were a lot better in 1920 than they were in, say, 1900, but flat tires were still a way of life. And looking at this, I mean, I see a fuel tank, but how do you actually get to that? Uh, yes, there's a fuel tank that's awkwardly situated underneath this luggage rack. And you see the filler neck is right here with the gas cap underneath it. Mm -hmm. How in the world do you get access to that? I have no idea. Well, like this. Would you look at that? It's magnetic. Wow. Innovation, innovation. There we go. How did we get this car? Passed through many hands. It's been to Harris collection at one point. When they began the restoration of this car, they thought it was a Biddle because one of its chief designers had designed cars for Biddle. And it was missing its logo, basically, which they didn't find until they discovered one in a huge collection of what they call badges. Mm. So we had to buy the entire collection of badges? They did indeed. So what's really impressive to me about this car is the power plant, the heart of this vehicle. What do you know about the engine itself? The engine in this car was made by Rochester under license, basically. They bought the manufacturing rights of the Duesenberg engine and it became the Rochester Duesenberg. Let's take a look at the engine. Wow, there it is in all its green glory. That was a trademark kind of Duesenberg thing. That's right? called Duesenberg green. Everything mm. that's green is a solid single iron casting. Most automobiles these days have engines with valves in the head that go up and down. And these are actuated by push rods or a cam that move a rocker on that actually push on that valve. Mm -hmm. And they're normally just a few inches long. Take a look at this. The valves in this engine are actually in there sideways. We're looking at the end of the valve right here. It's actuated by the camshaft is down here at the bottom of the engine. But instead of there being push rods, there's just a long rocker arm that goes from the valve all the way down to the camshaft and actuates the valve. So the rocker arms are almost a foot long. It's called a walking beam system. It's basically an overhead cam turned on its side. 
That's impressive. So cylinder positioning is still the same, inline yes. four cylinder. Mm -hmm. They just move the rocker arm around to the side. So Duesenberg Brothers obviously got their start in racing. Was this the really the beginning of their foray into the production vehicle? Yes. Fred and Augie Duesenberg started Duesenberg the next year, 1921, was the Model A Duesenberg. Yeah, so they didn't really waste much time. No, they didn't. Argon only was around for a year. They needed to figure something else exactly. out. Exactly, and they were making manufacturing a different engine altogether by that time. So thinking about the 100 horsepower and a four cylinder, you know, it reminds me of a 2024 Corolla GR, just modern technology. The car has three cylinders and 100 horsepower per cylinder. But it's evolution, Bobby. It's it not is. revolution. <laughs> <laughs> this is true, but this is naturally aspirated. Obviously, it is. The Toyota Corolla is a turbocharged mm -hmm. engine, uh, but it's just amazing to me the amount of horsepower that was available in the 1920s. I would assume that this was a standout performance-wise. It was. It was a very powerful engine for its time. Let's check out the interior of this Argon. Step Steven. right in and right underneath that steering wheel. I don't know about stepping wheel. right in here. <laughs> oh, some yoga. People, some people can't do that. Yoga pose. I made it. How does it feel? I mean, it feels like a million bucks to me. Doesn't it? What a nice, comfortable seat. And you feel sort of encapsulated in here. Yeah, I mean, the Roadster, definitely the open top is amazing. The big steering wheel. Lots of leverage, no power steering in those days. So yeah, you really needed that circumference to turn those big wheels. And no air conditioning, so you notice we have half of the windshield up here. That is nice, that is nice. You get the feeling that you're sitting in a sports car. This is an instrument built by the Waltham Watch Company. It's oh, a yeah. clock, odometer, speedometer, and trip odometer. Very nice, and I do see where the key goes, and then this must be a starter button. Exactly, starter button's over there. So push to start wasn't a new phenomenon. No. That actually existed back in the Absolutely. 1920s. But it is quite a driving experience, and on that note, how would you like to drive it? That would blow my mind, are you serious? Well, why don't we? Let's do it. Okay. Okay, so what do we got here? We have a four-speed. We do have a four-speed in this 1920 Argon. The startup procedure is pretty simple. Once this car has been warmed up, you turn the key on. Okay. Clutch in and uh, pull the starter button. Okay, now just let the clutch out, let it out nice and easy. Oh, the steering wheel's massive. I think you're a dead roll. I can't believe you guys are letting me drive cars. You probably have faith in you. I appreciate it. Oh, give it to me. What do you think it would have been like driving this car in the 20s? Do you think it would have gotten a lot of attention? Well, I think you would have been a pretty perfect person. You would have gotten a lot of attention. Yeah, I mean, pretty special to be able to have this on the road. You know, cars in the 1920s definitely did not look like this. Would this been a car that was driven on the weekends, a daily driver? It was probably somebody's daily driver, somebody who liked to drive. This was the sports car of its day, high performance. The Argonne Motor Car Company, based in Jersey City, New Jersey, operated for only two years, from 1919 to 1920, making these cars even more collectible. Their slogan was, sells without demonstration, which was like saying, trust us, this car is the best. So Argon is a, you know, obviously an iconic car. It's a sole survivor, but whatever happened to the brand? It fell victim to the post-World War I depression. It was hitting the country very hard in 1920. It put paid to quite a few high-end car companies. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of car manufacturers, I would assume, in the 1920s, but the Depression times really killed them. It did, especially the high-end cars. 
Even though the Jersey City Machine Company didn't survive, this mint condition, fully functional Argon did. And if you want to see it, you just need to come on down to the Fountainhead Antique Auto Museum in Fairbanks, Alaska.